us as husbands, our role, the authority that God has placed upon us, the authority he's given us, isn't to give our family what they want, but to give them what they need, which is a relationship with their Father in heaven. Because what we say doesn't matter, it's the example we set that matters. If I'm going to have self-control, then the only one responsible for how I respond, act, think, or feel is me. We're described as a bride. So, guys, we look to Jesus as an example because he loves us the way we're to love our wives. How Jesus loves the church, how Jesus acts towards the church is how we're to act towards our wives and children. We are doing a series right now on loving your wife as Christ loved the church. You know, it goes beyond just loving your wife. We're talking about family dynamics. We're talking about just relationships in general. And uh, last week, I threw it open that if anyone had any comments or things, and I had a few people that came up to me, um, Myra, who did, I don't see her here this morning, but uh, Pierre had some thoughts as well. So I'm going to get Pierre to share in a minute. Before I do that, I just want to welcome, I see a bunch of different uh, visitors here this morning. It's great to have you with us this morning. And please come up and say hello to me before you leave. And Fiona and Sam, it's great to have you guys back from China. So <laughs> they spend most of their year in China, and uh, they're, they're back uh, in the summer to be with their family here, and we get to enjoy them as extended family. So it's uh, great to have you for the time you're here. So, Pierre, do you uh, want to come up and share? So, last week, James uh, spoke about uh, self-control, and a few things came to mind as I was listening, and I shared it with James, and he asked me to share it this morning. Um, firstly, we have to know that Self-control is one of the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians 5, 22 to 23, I'll just read it. I don't have a slide up. Um, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things there is no law. Well, since it's a fruit of the Spirit, people might be tempted to think that it's something that we can ask God for and He will give us self-control and we'll be good, which is not the case. Um, it's a, you know, let's call it the side effect of having a spiritual life. So, you know, it's, it's something that we have to practice and we have to work at, you know, being in control of ourselves and the Holy Spirit will partner with us in this. So as we do our daily daily life, the Holy Spirit will prompt us in situations where we normally lose control or things like that. And He will work with us to so that we practice that that gear or that um, ability to have self control. And even in situations where everything inside of us would scream out to act out in our human nature, in our flesh. Um, the Holy Spirit would remind us. And the key to how we do this, because today is more about I, the practical implementations of how do we have self-control. And one of the key things is we have to spend time with God. We have to spend intimate time with Him by reading the Word, asking Him to open up His Word for us. But not just reading the Word, it's also talking to God and thanking Him. You know, the Bible says... Um, we should pray uh, with thankfulness. And it's on a daily basis, even sometimes an hourly basis, speaking to God and thanking Him for the things that we believe for, the things that we trust Him that when we walk into situations that we bring His light and His kingdom into that situation. See, the, the problem is when you when you're at church or when you've done Bible study or things like that, 
it's easy to have self-control. It's easy to be in a situation you're filled with God and, and it's, it's good. What happens typically in the week is we push God aside a little bit and we deal with this crisis that comes up in our lives or the work, some situation happens. And instead of asking God what to do, we take the problem head on and we end up being discouraged. We work at the problem in our own strength and eventually, at the end of the day, we're all tired and worn out, and then something happens, and you lose self-control. Then something happens, and none of the fruit of the Spirit comes out. It's only our flesh that comes out. And the solution to that is we need to learn and practice to, to seek God's input on a, daily, on a hourly basis. When, when we face a problem at work, when something blows up, when everything goes wrong, just this week, um, our Jeep died. And I knew when Melanie called me and said the Jeep doesn't want to start, I knew that this is, <laughs> this is a, a trial that I'm going through. And I'm not going to give in to the temptation to worry or things like that. And I went with great confidence and eventually got the Jeep started and got it back home. And as we stopped at home, I realized there's an electrical fault in the Jeep somewhere. And the starter motor just kept on going. So I disconnected the battery and, you know, as I'm looking as Thursday night, as I'm looking through what's going on, I just had this feeling of almost panic coming in. Because if it's an electrical fault, it's a... The Jeep is done. I mean, there'd be, it'd be too much money to fix. And I disconnected the battery and I left the Jeep, closed it up, and I went upstairs and I went to speak to God. And I said, God, I know this is not from you and I know this is the enemy is trying to get me to fail, get me to lose my identity. And, but I'm not going to let that happen. And I just spent time in the Word. And this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to, on a daily basis, if you feel something is just getting the best of you, take five minutes, take ten minutes, just go speak to God. Just find out what God wants to do in the situation, because the reality is, He is the solution. He's provided the solution already, even when we don't see it. You know, on Friday I looked, I didn't get time to look at a Jeep, and then on Saturday morning I tested and it appeared that there's a big problem with the electrical wiring. There was a dead short in, in the cables. And eventually I climbed underneath the Jeep and disconnected the starter motor. And the short went away, which means it's a simple fix. Uh, it's a bit of money, but it's not the end of the world. It's something we can do, and it, it's all good. So God always provides a way, even though... At the time when we face the problem, we might not see it. Um, you know, and then if we look at um, Paul going through, um, one of the things came to mind, if, when Paul was in prison and he's beaten up and, you know, his perspective, his mindset on how he looked at the trials that he's going through is he knew that it's, it's for... You know, if he had the mindset of, they've beaten me up, they've put me in prison, they might very well kill me. Um, and he led, led into what might be his natural feelings, panic, his fleshly things. He wouldn't have been able to write letters to the Galatians, for instance, in, in, sorry, in sorry, Philippians. Um, you know, let's just quickly read what Paul said. So in Philippians 1, verse 12 to 14, so this is Paul speaking, and he says, But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out to the furtherance of the gospel, so that it, is, so that it has become evident to the whole palace God and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And... Most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You know, so 
it's all about perspective and it's about when we face trials and, and we feel that there might be a situation that you know it's hard to have self-control it's to go back to God and say God help us to see this situation the way you see it and yeah so I just want to finish off with saying it's you know in those times when you find yourself where it's difficult to have fruits of the Holy Spirit um, just spend time with God and dig into him in that Ashish has something as well that he wanted to share. So, uh. yeah. So, um, well, I just want to add on to what Pierre was saying. Uh, and while he was talking about reading the word and, you know, uh, growing strong in the Lord. So, so God gave me a word. It is Colossians uh, 2, verse 7. Um, it says, let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will go, grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with, thank, with thankfulness. So, uh, usually God, usually God has given, you know, uh, we, we forget what, has, what God has done in our life. We, we tend to, you know, um, we tend to ask for more, and we, we don't really realize what God has done in our life till now. So, I would, I would encourage the church that they spend, spend time in, in the Word. They, they get up early in the morning, and, and, and keep some time aside, uh, read the word, you know, uh, uh, reflect on the, on the words that you read, and then, then spend some time with God alone. You know, that will help you to build your roots deep in Him. So whenever you have trouble, whenever you face some problem, then, then the words will speak to you. Then the words will speak to you, God will guide you. Now if you don't spend your time um, with the word, or you spend time with God, then when the troubles come, you will not have, you know, you will, you, those words will not speak to you. And, and th this is the same when, when, you know, when there's a storm and there are a lot of trees, you see that the, there are a lot of trees which have fallen. But only the trees which have strong roots, they stand for, for many years, right? So, so it's very important that, uh, as the word says in Colossians 2.7, that we need, to spend, we need to spend time with God. We need to spend time in the word. And, and we need to actually reflect on those words so that, they become, they become real in our life. That's great. It's wonderful when we have people sharing different things and different perspectives, right? Because that's where we actually are truly being the body of Christ. So for, for visitors this morning, for people that are here regularly, that's normal. But for those that are visiting, wondering what are they doing, why are they doing it, we firmly believe here that we are a priesthood of all believers, that we are, that we all come. Scripture actually talks about the early church in Corinthians. And, you know, they had a, you know, while things were a bit chaotic in the Corinthian church, everyone was coming, bringing a word. Everyone was coming, bringing a song. They're bringing different things uh, to the meeting. So, you know, if we're here in worship and God gives you a song, you know, assuming that you can sing, come up and share the song with us. You know, we, we, we can't do multiple bands all, and things along those lines. But if there's a song on your heart that God's given you, then come and lead us in song. You know, if God's giving you a word, come share that word on a Sunday. If, if you really have something burning in your heart, like, James, I really believe that there's this word that God's given me for the church. Let me know, Bef you know, ideally beforehand, but let me know on Sunday. We're going to give you space for it as we can because God speaks to every single person here. God doesn't speak to me on behalf of you. You know, he does. He, he gives me the wisdom to lead the church it gives me direction that the church is going in and what to share with us from here. But at the end of the day, we're all to hear from God ourselves, every, every one of us. And so the encouragement that we've received this morning through the testimonies, through Pierre sharing, through Ashish sharing, these are all key things. I believe there were specific people here that needed to hear the exact things that they were sharing morning. And it's a wonderful thing when we do that, because if they didn't, I wouldn't necessarily share that thing, and then you wouldn't get to hear what it is that you needed to hear. So I'm going to share now, on, uh, as we continue here, we're going to look at the scripture in 1 John 4, verses 15 to 19. And it says, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. 
let's pause for a minute there. This is a theme, right? We went from Peter about the fact that we participate in the divine nature of God last week. And here we're reading in John. He says, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. It's an incredible thing when we've received the Holy Spirit because that connection, that we, we've, God comes and dwells with us. And Scripture also tells us that we're, our spirit is seated with Christ on the throne in heaven. It, it's such a beautiful thing when we realize how connected to God we are, how accepted we are, that God isn't out there, but that God is intimately with us. We're intimately connected with Him. So when we're allowing ourselves to be led by Him, what we're doing, when we're led by our Spirit, we're allowing God who dwells with us, in us, to lead us. It's the same that Jesus did when He was here on earth. He gave up all His divine powers when He came and He constrained Himself to being a man. And we look at what Jesus did, but He understood His participation with the Father and with the Spirit. And we have that same participation when we put our trust in Jesus. We haven't become God not a new age concept. We aren't all, we haven't become God. But God's spirit has come to dwell in us. It's incredible. It doesn't take us over. It doesn't mean that you suddenly are, you know, the body snatcher comes as the Holy Spirit, the body snatcher takes you over. You know. You know how imperfect you are. You know you haven't been taken over. Okay? But God comes and dwells within you to lead, to guide you and as you surrender to his, your spirit, you you allow that divine nature within you to come out and and to be a light to the world. And so I'll start again there. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. Again, not a worldly definition of love. People take this scripture and it's like, oh yeah, as long as I have nice warm feelings for someone, then oh, that's perfect. That's all that God wants. No, no, no. God's definition of love is completely different. It's not just about a nice warm fuzzy feeling for the person you like. Right? Like, oh, I, I love people. I love everyone. Isn't that wonderful? God is love. Yes, He is. And His divine nature, that holy, perfect, sanctified nature comes and dwells within us. And that nature that allows us to live out the love that God truly has for us and for others around us. But it's a perfect love, not a worldly love. It's not a love that's just limited to the people that respond well to us, but it's a love that goes far beyond that. A love that has patience even for our enemies. A love that allows us to be persecuted by people and still respond in kindness. A love that allows us to stand when we are going through the most difficult times because we know and we are secure in our love and identity in God. So God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. In this world, so in this world, not in heaven, in this world, we are like Jesus. We love like Jesus. We act like Jesus. Are we perfect like Jesus? No. Do we get it right all the time? No. But... Our, our baseline, our thing that we're going, oh, this is the way we're meant to live when we live from our spirit is we live like Jesus did. Now, lots of people like to go, oh, wait, but this is living like Jesus did. And we take a portion of how Jesus lived and we identify with that. It's like, okay, well, Jesus fed the poor. But, you know, Well, actually, Jesus didn't spend a lot of time feeding the poor. But we can make that our big thing. It's like, oh, it's all about that. Or we get, oh, well, Jesus healed the sick. And it's all about healing the sick. Well, yeah, Jesus did heal the sick, but it wasn't all that he did. He also went to the cross. 
He also loved his enemies. He also taught many. He was an example and a discipler of those around him. He loved. There's so many things that Jesus did. And we are to live like Jesus in all ways. Not just in our favorite way. When the Spirit empowers us, it doesn't just empower us for our pet project or the way we want to be. It empowers us to live godly lives in every way. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. I read verse 18 and 19 again. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. But lo we love because he first loved us. So we're able to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves because God has first loved us. And He loved us. He demonstrated that love by sending His Son who died on our behalf, who died and rose again. It was the perfect sacrifice so that we could be reconciled to God. That's, that's the type of love that God has. He did what we couldn't do. He, went, he didn't wait for us to get it together. He knew we couldn't. He did what we could not do and made a way for us to be put back in perfect relationship with Him. He did it all. We just get to participate. He did it all. And when we understand what He's done... It takes fear out of the equation. Because we can't undo what God has done. We can reject what God's done for us. We cannot accept it. We can go, no, that's too good to be true. Or, or well, no, I still need to do this to earn God's love. We can live in that. And then we live in a limited re thing with God. Or, but we don't have to live in that place. We don't have to live in a place of fear. He's done it all for us. And that His perfect love drives fear out of the equation. This is essential in our understanding if we're going to be able to love our wives as Christ loves the church, if wives are going to love our husbands that way, if we're going to love our kids that way, if we're going to love uh, those that, are, are, that we have relationship with that way, if we're going to love our enemies the way that we're called to do that. The basis of our love for others must first come from a place of us understanding that we are perfectly loved by God. And that no matter how much we mess up, we can't undo the love He has for us. Again, you can reject it. You can choose not to accept it. While God loves everyone in the world, it doesn't mean that everyone is accept has accepted that love and has an intimate relationship with Him. But God extends His love to us to invite us into that intimate relationship with Him. He invites you into this deep, close relationship. He wants to model what your relationship with the rest of the world is going to look like. And He does. It's why you know, Pierre said it, Ashish said it about us reading Scripture. We, we read Scripture to understand God's love to understand God's character, to understand who He is. We don't read Scripture because if we don't, from a standpoint of going, oh my goodness, if I don't read Scripture, God's going to be mad at me. That would be like someone writing a book about me and me being upset with you because you haven't read the book about me. In the limited human understanding that I can give, or example that I can give. You know, if someone wrote a book about me, would you prefer to have a relationship with the book? Or would I prefer if you had a relationship with the book or a relationship with me? 
Put it in your own shoes. If someone, if someone wrote a book about you, and you, you participated in the writing of that book, you know, you, maybe you sat with, you, they were, you had a ghost writer. God had a holy ghost writer. Pardon the terrible pun. But, you know, imagine, so you, you didn't write it. You sat with someone and, and, and they got to know you and they wrote it. And actually a lot of different people using the scripture as an example wrote it. But if there was someone, if your children, would you want your children to read the book about you or to have a relationship with you? I can imagine that we would want to have a relationship, correct? You'd want your kids to have a relationship with you. Now, Again, do not read more into what I'm saying than I'm saying. Because I'm not saying you shouldn't read the Bible. You should. It's a way, it helps us understand our Father in Heaven. It helps us understand what He's done throughout history. It helps us have a bigger picture of God. It was assembled and put together so that when people would come and make stuff up about God, we would have something to go, no, actually that is not God's character. Something that people could refer to that was described God's character. But I say this because to truly understand God's love, it's got to go beyond Scripture. Scripture. It's got to go with it beyond just reading about God, but to be participating with Him. To be having understanding that He dwells within you, that you have a relationship with Him that is that intimate. Because the closest intimate relationship you have to that here on earth is that with your partner, with your wife or your husband. Where two become one. And God, in His perfect love, has set an example in how He loves us. With a love that's so perfect that it drives, He wants it to drive fear out of the equation. He wants fear driven out of your life when it comes to your relationship with Him. We see fear a lot in the Old Testament. You know, it was a shadow of things to come. Where there was a divide between God and His people. Where there wasn't the level of intimacy that we have with God now. Where there wasn't an understanding of that. And Jesus hadn't yet come. And you know, if you've raised children, you understand that there's a certain point as they're growing that fear is a tool. In other words, you're going to do this, and if you do that, there's a consequence to that action. I'm not saying you should, you know, I'm not saying in anger or things like that, but there's a consequence to the action. Hey, if you do this, then there's going to be some type of punishment. Because we're training our children to not touch a hot stove or to make their bed, or to listen to their parents, or the myriad of other things that we have to train our children in. But our goal with our kids, you know, when, when your children are adults, that doesn't work anymore. You're relying on the relationship and the intimacy that you've developed with your children to maintain a relationship with them as they get older. You're relying on the wisdom that you've imparted to them, not that they're still obeying you out of fear. While in their immaturity, fear may be something that's used, as we grow and mature in God, it's not about fear. It's about love. It's about love. Now, as adults, and our relationships 
with our spouses. It's all about love. And I'm realizing I'm out of time, which means I get to follow this up again next week. But I want to leave you with a crucial thing here. You see, we're talking about getting practical with this thing of self-control. And I've just spent a whole lot of time talking about perfect love. Fear-based action is not self-control. If I do this, I'm going to get punished, so I'm not going to do it, is not self-control. Self-control is being able to make decisions Regard, not based on punishment, but based on self-restraint. Making the right choice, even if it's costly. Self-control in our relationships with our spouses, with our children, with those around us. If we are in a relationship with them and we're not exhibiting fear to them, if we're having them obey us out of fear, then it's the wrong thing we're doing in that relationship. We're not loving our spouses as Christ loved the church if we're using fear to get them to do what we think they should do or what we want them to do. Now, that's present in your relationship. I'm not saying this to condemn you, but to open your eyes to see, because you likely, if you're doing that, believe that God is going to punish you and is wanting, is using fear to control you. And God wants you to understand how perfectly He loves you. Does it mean that your actions are without consequence? No, there's natural consequences to our actions. If we don't forgive, we invite the tormentor into our life, not because God sends them, but because that's the spiritual realities of the world we live in, of what, the world that God's created. It's a natural consequence of our unforgiveness, not a punishment from God. God loves you with the most incredible, perfect love. And that perfect love drives fear out of the equation. And He wants us to understand that we are to love everyone around us, but first and foremost, our, our, our wives, our husbands, with that type of perfect love. That perfect love that covers over a multitude of sins, that doesn't use control or manipulation or things along those lines. The practical of getting there, there's only one real practical way. And it's for you to ask yourself in all situations that you find yourself in, anytime you feel anger, anytime you feel fear, anytime you feel threatened, anytime you feel insecure, let those be warnings that you've lost God's perspective on a situation. And that the most important thing you can do is as soon as possible, go and spend a bit of time with your father. Remind yourself that he loves your father in heaven. Remind yourself that he loves you. That he cares for you. That no situation you're facing is a surprise to him. It may be that you're in a really tough situation and it's going to be a difficult road back. But God knows how to help and lead you and guide you down that road. A practical example, and then I'll wrap up. So yesterday I went early into the office and because I had a bunch of things that I needed to get caught up on uh, this weekend. And we had the picnic yesterday, and anyway, I got caught in a train of thought, and I, I you know, it was like 3.30, and I'm still at the office, and I got to come home and pick up my family and get to the picnic, and I'm thinking, I'd forgotten I told Melanie about putting up some signs, and I'm thinking, I got to bring signs and put them up, and I got to get there early. And so, 
immediately a bit of fear comes into the equation for me because, uh uh-oh, I've messed up. I don't have enough time. And so then I go home to pick up my family, and they're not ready. Now, I haven't told them to be ready at this time. I just expect that they've read my mind, and they're all going to be ready and waiting at the door when I pull up in the car, and let's get in the car and go out, right? Because that's a reasonable expectation, isn't it? Not a reasonable expectation at all, you know? And so I pull up, and, and they're, they're 90% ready, but they're still not. And uh, it's taking time, and the boys are taking time, and, and I'm getting more stressed because, oh, no, I've let everybody down, and fear is coming into the equation for me. I'm starting to feel, con- I'm starting to condemn myself. And so what do I do in that situation? Those things come in, and... and in that moment, because fear, I've allowed fear into my heart, then I get a bit snappy. You know, I don't, nothing over the top, but it's like, come on, you know, to the boys, the, one boy's in the bathroom, and it's like, bang, bang, bang on the door, come on, hurry up, you know, and stuff that, what does that do? As soon as you do that, it puts fear into them, right? Puts fear into them. So I achieve what I'm wanting to do, I get them into the car, but in the most unhelpful of ways. Most unhelpful. Why? Because I allowed fear into my own heart. Because I planned poorly. Because that was me. And so often in our relationships and in our marriages, that's what happens. We allow fear to enter our hearts. And then as opposed to letting love what comes out of us is we start producing fear in the hearts of the people around us. Why? Because it's what we've taken on. But as we allow God's perfect love to drive fear out of our lives, then what the people around us is experience love. Me using self-control in that situation would have got me home 15 minutes earlier or had me make a call to my family beforehand so that when, we got, when I got home, it's not this panic situation that, come on, they got to jump to, to cover up for my error. And it's a simple example, but a real one. Now, you know, years ago, that would have been like a total freak out for me. I would have been really angry with my family. And then probably the first half hour of the barbecue, I would have been stressed out of my mind. Fortunately, God's driven fear enough out of my life that I could recognize what I'd done before we even left the driveway, could acknowledge stuff to my son in the car on the way there, say something to my wife at the barbecue, and forget about it. And I can bring it up as an example now, you know, as a teaching tool, but with no condemnation for myself. And may we all get to that. I want to be in the place where that doesn't happen anymore at all. But it's just an example of how fear gets in the way of self-control and perfect love. So as you go about your week this week, the most important thing you can be doing is anytime you feel fear, insecurity, anger, ask yourself, man, am I forgetting that God loves me and that He, He can teach me and get me through this situation? He can cover the situation. He loves you that much. Every one of you here today, He loves you that much. So, thank you for indulging my five minutes over. And uh, have an amazing week. Enjoy the wonderful summer weather. Enjoy coffee and cookies at the back. And love one another while you're here. If you're a visitor, please come up and say hello to me. I would love to uh, get to know you. And uh, take care. (laughs) 